Hello, I'm Tony Guida. This is my New York. A small item out of Hollywood the other day caught my attention. In an unprecedented move, MGM is handing the top job at Orion Pictures to a young producer, a woman who is black and queer. It was MGM's admission of failure that for all of Hollywood's efforts to diversify an industry ruled by white men, very little has changed. That's no surprise to the author of this book, Diversity Inc., the failed promise of a billion dollar business. Hear all about it from author and professor of journalism, Pamela Newkirk, next. Pamela Newkirk, good to see you again. Welcome back to the program. It's a pleasure to be with you again. Uh, your book, Diversity Inc., I should tell everybody, has just come out in paperback. And just to make sure we understand terms that you're using correctly, when you're talking about diversity, you're not just talking about African Americans, equality for them, but for also Hispanics and Asian Americans, and of course, men and women in there. In that intro, I talk about. Um, this move by uh, MGM Pictures and Orion and what they've done, which is unprecedented. And I wonder, do you grow weary about hearing about American firsts? <laughs> After all this time, the first this, the first that, do you get weary hearing about that yes. so late in this game? Yeah, it's part of uh, what inspired me to do this book because throughout my career, whether in daily journalism yeah. or in academia, you know, we, we were having the same conversations, you know, so my career spanning like 35 years, listening to the same conversation about diversity and seeing the needle barely move in just about every field. What I saw was the same persistent kind of um, unwillingness to, to really open, open the floodgates. I wanted to look at race because that is where this conversation really began. And I wanted to look um, to see what had been done in the 50 years that diversity has been part of the you know, lexicon in, in American life. The national conversation you're talking about originates uh, with the Kerner Commission uh, 52 years ago, finding that, you know, the nation is divided one society one black one white and uh separate, and unequal. separate, separate but unequal and the numbers i mean i guess one way to look at this is the numbers of of uh for instance corporations and and cultural institutions i, I read a number that you know eight billion dollars a year is spent by those institutions on on diversity and more more than that 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 more, figure that figures from more than a decade ago it's far oh, more than that now yeah. yeah and so little is you know for that money they're getting they're apparently getting nothing right well they get what they're getting is the appearance of caring about the issue but what they're doing is they're they're spending money on initiatives that have been shown to fail. <laughs> so th they're doing the same thing year after year and spending billions of dollars doing it and nothing's changing. So instead of changing strategies, they continue to pour money into failed practices. One of the, the examples I cite in the book is that Google alone has spent more than 100, and 100 million a year on diversity initiatives and year after year, they release these diversity reports which show that people of color, uh, particularly African Americans and Latinos, are barely represented. So why would you continue to do something that you know doesn't work? <laughs> why not think about new strategies? You, ca you can't farm this out to diversity consultants and to um, chief diversity officers who are often marginalized within these institutions. You, you have to do something differently. So that is, that is what my book is looking at. So what have institutions done that have succeeded? And what do most institutions do that explains why we're still in this, in this uh, situation? 
Well, Google, I mean, it's a great example. This is a company, I mean, we all know what Google is, that in a, in a, in a millionth of a second, you can call up information, you know, from 2000 years ago, because it's all that they know how to do this. They know how to be a billion, trillion, whatever they are, billion dollar search engine company and more. They know exactly. technology. But, right. so, when you say they, you know, farming diversity initiatives out to consultants and stuff like that, I mean, has it ever occurred to Google to use its own intelligence to say, hey, wait a minute, we're pretty smart. We can exactly. solve this. Exactly. If they Googled it, they could probably <laughs> be more successful at tackling this issue than continuing to do what they now do. Uh, you know, a lot of this has very little to do with how much money you spend on it. It really comes down to leadership, will, and intention. And once you have that, and you're looking at the strategies that have actually borne fruit, um, you know, you can get at this, like one of the, the, the best ways to ensure diversity and to, and to uh, retain diversity is mentoring something as simple as mentoring but what happens oftentimes african americans and latinos in particular are so marginalized and alienated in these spaces and so there's no investment in their development and 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 so there's like this revolving door among that population it's hard not to get the impression that these diversity efforts throughout corporate land and cultural institutions and everything else. And all of that money and the consultants is really uh, an effort to shield them, those organizations from, uh, from discrimination lawsuits. Yeah, well, that's, one, that's one of the theories that um, I raised by a professor at Berkeley, Lauren Edelman, who has studied uh, anti-discrimination policies over decades. And what she has found is that the courts are more concerned with the apparatus of diversity when they're looking at discrimination suits than they are the efficacy of, of the apparatus. And so mm -hmm. companies then can see that if they erect the apparatus, that in itself can be a shield from, you know, uh, uh, discrimination, successful discrimination lawsuits. Well, these discrimination lawsuits can get pretty, pretty expensive. I mean, one of the examples I think you cited in the book is, you know, Coca-Cola paid out, what was it, 190, close to $200 million a few years ago, not, you know, 15, 20 years ago. Right, but, in, imagine, in but imagine if a Google was sued today and what the settlement could be when you look at the virtual exclusion of large segments of the population. Blacks and Latinos alone are 31% of the U.S. population, and yet they're somewhere like 2 or 3% of, of workers at a place like Google. And when you look at the tech fields, the, the tech positions, it's, it's even lower. So imagine what settlements could look like today. So $100 million is a drop in the bucket for a company like Google. And the thing is, you know, they that money if they really were um, interested in in diversity could be used to kind of um, shore up resources in under resourced communities where where there's a hunger for this kind of technology training access to computers access to you know um, all of the things that can help under resourced schools and, and children um, gain more proficiency or they can begin to broaden their network that they look to for job opportunities. Like looking at the HBCUs, you know, historically black colleges and universities, looking right. at the percentage of students of color who study engineering and computer science, that number has really grown um, in, in recent years. And so there is, a talent pool that they can draw on, that they can, you know, invest in training and, and developing, but instead they, they erect this diversity shield that is doing nothing, obviously, to increase diversity. But I don't mean to pick on Google because this is a, pro this is a systemic problem. It's across the board, you know, whether we're looking at um, 
higher education or architecture or fashion or film or Hollywood. Yes, we know throughout. I mean, Hollywood is, is uh, Oscar is so white and, and, uh, right. and, 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 and MGM congratulating itself that they've, that they've finally given a black woman the chance to green light to say, we'll make this movie. <laughs> no, we won't make that movie. Exactly. And that's the first time that's the first time that's ever happened in Hollywood in twenty twenty is coming around. So and, now, yeah. and how old is the film industry, right? We're yeah. looking at a hundred year old industry. We're looking at the Oscars is more than eighty years old. And it's yeah, like well and, and it started here in the East, people should remember, but that's okay. another book. That's exactly. another book. Um, I, I want to come back to the Coca-Cola and that 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 uh, discrimination lawsuit that they had to settle. Uh, and how it was a wake-up call but in, in a minute. But I want to come to what seems to be the, the central thesis of your book, which is diversity is not going to succeed without a, without a, a cultural reckoning that, that, that America, principally white America, has to come to terms with the white domination of this country over, over black slaves and over the Native Americans who we threw off their land and basically murdered. It, it, is that a fair summary of the thesis? Oh yeah, it's it's very fair because I think you know in in our country we like to think of any um, success story of a minority, a woman of color, a uh, person that represents our the, that we've overcome racial problems. Yeah. And so after the election of Barack Obama there was this sense, and not just a sense, I mean, post-race was the, that was the term everyone was using to describe America. We had overcome our racial issues, even as every economic social indicator showed these wide disparities that remained. Um, and, and they're disparities that we had begun to, to close, um, you know, after, President Johnson's Great Society programs in the 70s, we have begun to see the gap between um, blacks and whites on education, income, poverty, all of those things were, were beginning to align and we were beginning to see something, you know, coming much closer to a, a equal society. And then there was this virulent backlash to that progress. And we've been living in that backlash since the 70s, since uh, the late 70s with the, the Bakke uh, decision uh, that, that went to the Supreme Court, which prohibits um, institutions from looking at the history and legacy of race uh, to, to, to make amends and to, do, to you know, have strategies that kind of correct um, those historical issues. And so ever since then, we have been kind of like look, trying to find a way to address diversity or address discrimination without using the terms, without looking at his, the historical context, without recognizing the ways in which race continues to operate in this country. Um, you know, I think if there's one silver lining from the tragedies that we continue to see, but that broke through after George Floyd's uh, uh, death, I think there is more of a recognition by more, more of white America that we are living in two worlds, um, black, white, separate and unequal. And you know, it manifests itself, yes, in the criminal justice system, but if you're allowed to treat people the way that George Floyd was treated and the young man um, more recently was treated who was shot seven times in his, in his back at close range. If you can yeah. do that with impunity, in what other ways are we um, treating people of color as less than? So I think more and more there's, there's a recognition that, that we do need some kind of, of reckoning uh, for, for the systemic bias that metastasizes in the lack of diversity, in unequal pay, unequal opportunity. Um, and, 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 you know, if, if you're looking at police brutality, that's just one way of looking at the manifestation. Well, it, it strikes me, you know, on your point, uh, Pamela, it strikes me that if an American were shot 
seven times in the back in, let's say, the Middle East, there would be an enormous outcry for justice and for uh, retribution and for, you know, state uh, action that this can, an American shot in the back seven times. But we get a black man, he's defined not as American, he's defined as a black man. Right. And And that seems to change the whole uh, uh, consideration. Precisely. And I mean, we, there are so many names, so many, these episodes, it's, it, it happens so with such regularity that I think most people are kind of, you know, kind of numb to it. I mean, we, we, over breakfast cereal, we're just watching black people being slaughtered in the street, unarmed black people. And it happens. And oftentimes there, there's no retro, you know, there's nothing, you know, these officers usually go free. And even if they're released from one police force, they go on to another. And yeah. yeah. And so yeah, how, how do you deal with diversity when you're not even dealing with the issue of basic human rights on the street, your exactly. basic right to walk down the street to, to, you know, we had that situation with the bird watcher in central park. Sure. Uh, who, who a, a, a police officer has called on him because he asked a woman to put her dog on a leash where yeah. you can just weaponize race in a way it's a shorthand in this country that at least now there is the growing recognition that this is not a figment of, of black people's imaginations. I mean, this is something that happens so routinely and for whatever reason, white America is now recognizing it. Um, You know, your mention of the the, uh, Great Society uh, programs of Lyndon Johnson, I mean, that was public policy. And I'm wondering, can there be diversity of the kind we, I think, would all uh, welcome in this country without public policy to address the economic uh, inequality. I mean, we've got the 1% and the 99%. Right. Can, we, can we get to, can we get anywhere with diversity without public policy addressing yeah. that? Yeah, because it really is, it's fundamentally a leadership issue. And it's also, you know, it, it's it's one of these issues that it you have to take such a holistic approach to it because it's also education it's it's looking at the curricular the curriculum in in most schools in this country mm. you could graduate with a post doctorate degree and never have to seriously confront the myriad ways race is implicated in everything in our society you know it's like just embedded in, in the American DNA. And until we begin to pick that apart and really study the ways in which race manifests in, in every single way, it's the air we breathe, and yet we try to ignore it and pretend that we're an equal society, we've never achieved that. And until we begin to like sort of integrate some of this into the curriculum from the earliest levels of uh, educational system and go all the way through, we're never really going to be able to make um, much, much progress on this issue because there's, it, it's like we're living in uh, two completely different worlds with complete, a completely different understanding of, of equality and inequality mm-hmm. and, and how it operates. Coming back uh, to that uh, uh, Coca-Cola anti-discrimination lawsuit in in the 200 million or whatever it was they had to pay, turned out to be a wake-up call and they're one of the success stories that you cite in the book about turning things around because they did it from the top. Yes, they're a success story, not only because they paid out the settlement, it's because they had the right leadership that actually took the task seriously. They also, as part of the settlement, they um, had a task force um, that oversaw uh, what the measures that they would take. Over five years, they looked at every single thing that, they, that uh, they oversaw every 
the whole operation. For instance, um, they would report on any openings and what the candidate pool looked like and what the, uh, they, they would look at evaluations. The, the chief diversity officer there developed a system that he looked at employees across the company and looked at um, salaries, promotions, bonuses, everything across racial and gender lines. And so they were able to, to detect patterns of bias that would mm -hmm. metastasize in unequal pay and unequal promotions, unequal opportunities, unequal um, candidate pools, who, who was in the room, who, who even had an opportunity to apply for a job. So before you could even make an offer to a candidate, they would evaluate whether equality, <laughs> you know, was, was um, part of the decision. And so over five years, they were able to make significant strides on diversity, on opportunity, and um, Sal, you know, to bring salaries in line across racial lines, because part of the lawsuit, uh, what they found is that even when African Americans held the same titles as their white peers, they were still paid less. And yeah. so they just, yeah. I have, but I have a, I have a couple of questions about that success. I'm not, I'm not questioning the success, but Coca-Cola, um, is a company like so many others in this country, maybe every other company, in which the CEO makes probably a thousand times the pay At of, least. of an average worker. Yeah. So you've got in, you've got economic inequality. You got one percent, ninety nine percent in Coca Cola and every other, mostly every other company. Right. And you've got Coca Cola coming out publicly a couple of years ago in support of the Trump tax cuts. So a company that that uh, that appears to value diversity and equality as much as they do and have succeeded, yet on the other hand seems to be an avatar of inequality. Yeah, you know, there's no panacea in this, right? That we can only we could do better than we're doing. I don't know if there's anything that we can do that's going to as long as we have a capitalist system the Coca-Colas of the world are gonna reign supreme. And we're just looking for some equality within these, these unequal structures, right? Um, but but what, what, it, what that case study showed and why I thought it was important to, to examine it mm -hmm. is to look at what a company can do to systemically dismantle um, structural inequality in the workplace. And they created a system that I think can be applied to any institution that that really wants to do something about this. Just a, a further expansion, I think, on your your central theme is your um, citing or at least referring referencing what you what I think you term with the mythology of race right. that w too many people in this country look at. A racial situation, a, a black person or a, a Hispanic person, as not being worthy of right. Right. diversity, of, right. of, of, of opportunity. Because we live with this mythology, but the mythology comes out of the way race has been taught in this country. I mean, you know, a hundred years ago when you know, a young African was exhibited in the Bronx Zoo monkey house for which they just apologize. Um, your, by the way, your book was extraordinary about Oda Banga and that thank you. horrific yeah, incident. Talked, yeah, we talked about it five years ago and I remember yeah. you were one of the journalists who tried to get the Bronx Zoo to answer for what had happened and they refused. So for five more years, they stonewalled and then, you know, yeah. It took them 114 years to say we're sorry. Years to say that what we did was wrong because for more than 100 years they engaged in a cover up. They kind of lied about what happened or they allowed yeah. lies to flourish about what happened. But anyway, the reason why that incident was able to happen is because the most elite men of science at that time were saying that Africans were between a, a baboon and a, and a human, that they weren't fully human anyway. That is how that happened. That is how it became this global sensation. Mm -hmm. and, and that 
that ideology continues to flourish, even if it's not spoken anymore, it's so deeply embedded in the American psyche because it's, it's been taught for so long and it's also embedded in film and in iconography. And it's like the, there's this shorthand that is used to kind of endorse that belief that- White hat, white hat, black hat. White hat, good, black hat, bad. Right, and it, it's, you don't even have to use the words anymore. It's so like you could just use a shorthand and symbols. And so um, that's why I, I think, you know, in this book, I wanted to show that, yes, you can have all of these strategies to improve diversity. You can have this multi-billion dollar apparatus around diversity, but until you truly look at structural inequality in the myriad ways that we are telling, we are saying that African Americans, Latinos, Native Americans are less than, how do you then have workplaces that are equal if people don't believe that <laughs> their, their, their colleagues of color deserve to be there? Pamela Newkirk, it's great to see you again. The subject is so fraught. Um, Diversity Inc. It, it's out now in paperback and people ought to get it. It's good to see you, Pamela. Stay Thank well. You so much, Tony. It's a pleasure. Thank you.